record. All right, so that's a new feature. You may be getting a prompt to say, I accept or um, that. Okay, so we're going to get into strategic planning. I'm gonna share my screen. This is the only module in the RLI curriculum that covers two blocks of time. There's a lot to cover. Uh, we want this to be interactive as possible. So do not hesitate to ask questions, um, provide some maybe personal experience you may have with strategic planning, uh, either from your Rotary Club or maybe even in your professional life. Um, so let me start with our module. Uh, one second. Okay, does everyone see the RLI materials? Okay. Yes. So uh, as you remember, we, we try to, before we get into the meat, take a look at the little sentence that's under the title, because that often provides us with insight, which is interesting because insight's in the sentence. But like, what, what are we trying to figure out here? I can strengthen my club by promoting and leading insightful planning. Now, again, I don't write the curriculum. I promote it. Um, I would add strategic since strategic is in the title and not all planning is strategic, but we'll talk about that. Um, but like we talked about before, all of us, regardless of our role, we've got some presidents elect who are with us. We've got some board members. We've got some people who are just members of, the, of their club. Anyone in a Rotary Club can help the club with planning. Uh, we've made a really big push this past year to help clubs with planning. We set up a a strategic planning cadre to help clubs who may know that it's important but may not have the skill set to kind of figure out how to move it forward. So it really is important. Um, and so we're going to we're going to go through every aspect of this. Session goals are to understand the value and the process for strategic planning. We're going to spend a lot of time looking at the process. Uh, how to analyze your Rotary Club. So we're not going to analyze it today, but we're going to talk about the process for analyzing. Uh, reviewing possible areas of improvement. So presumably, regardless of how successful our club is, we can always do better. You know, it's, it's uh, good is good is good, but great is better, right? Um, and discuss how those improvements should be made. So that's, in a sense, those four goals are kind of like processes of planning. Each one is kind of a, a stage, and we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, I'm going to shift over to a Word document that we're going to use to capture your thoughts and ideas. And I'm not going to really share the RLI manual anymore for, for one primary reason, which is I'm not really that thrilled with how they lay out their topics. So I, I tend to do it a different way. So my recommendation is don't try to find what question we're on because I, I, I kind of facilitate this a little bit differently. Um, hopefully it'll not confuse you. Just don't try to um, cross-reference where we are with where the questions are. Okay, so now I'm gonna shift over to our Word document. Can everyone see this? Yeah. So. I'm gonna facilitate the discussion. A lot of it's gonna come from you. And when we're done, and when we're done with RLI, I'm gonna save this and send it to Kathy and she'll send it out along with the YouTube videos and all of that. So strategic planning, that's the title. I like to think about three stages of strategic planning. Um, I like that there's only three because if there were five, I would confuse it with the stages of grief. Um, but there's only three. And we're going to talk about each stage. Remember, one of the goals was to understand the process. So there's really three key stages. There's before the planning or pre-planning or planning to plan or preparing to plan. There's the planning itself, including the plan, the actual outcome of the planning effort. And then there's post-planning which includes implementing the plan. And we'll talk quite a bit about that and adjusting the plan if needed. So plans are not 
rock solid cast in stone they are adjusting. Uh, for those of you who are presidents now, I think there's a few of you. Um, if you had a plan, it probably had to be adjusted when COVID happened. So you, you want to make sure that the plan is is malleable, that it that it kind of adjusts to circumstances so that it's relevant. So we're going to cover these and we've got roughly 90 minutes to do that. So let's start with a definition because it does say strategic plan in the title. So um, what does strategic mean? And again, just open up your mics and I will capture what you say and you'll see it on the screen. So if I don't get it right, say, Jeff, you didn't get it right. Um, Purposeful what is intent. Say it again. Purposeful intent. Oh, I love that. Uh, can you elaborate on what you mean by purposeful intent? Um, having given thought and put uh, um, the steps in place for the specific outcome you're looking for instead of accidentally falling into it. Right. And it's interesting in that little sentence, it uses the term insightful, which <laughs> kind of fits this a little bit, but yeah. Purposeful intent. Um, Rotary clubs typically are not successful by accident, right? Yeah. If they are, that's great, but it doesn't sustain. Um, so that's great. Okay, thank you. Purposeful intent. What else does strategic mean? Jeff, I, I, I see it as being broad and long term in scope, as opposed to something that just is for next week. So for an entire year or uh, several years and dealing with fundamental issues. Okay, let's go back to your first one. Whoops. So broad and long-term in scope. So um, some clubs have a one-year plan. And what we say is that's great to have a one-year plan. That's much better than not having a plan or having a one week plan. But as you're right, strategic suggests longer term. Uh, think about global grants and other activities in your club that are more than one year in their time frame. It would be hard to plan for activities that take longer than one year if your plan is only a one year plan. So Rotary recommends a strategic plan and, and Sonny, you, you can quote this verbatim, but our, our RI president is recommending that all clubs have a plan and then it be longer than one year in part because a lot of the activities that go on within the club are more than one year in time frame, And so it makes sense to have a plan that aligns with some of the club activities. Sonny, do you have a either the quote or kind of the reinforcement from our RI president on this? There wasn't a specific quote on this one, Jeff. The quote was about Rotary isn't just a club you can join. But Holger did make a request of all clubs that they have a strategic plan, at least one strategic planning meeting this year, create a plan. It will make a difference in our success from now going forward. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. And it may be the first time in the last few years at least that an RI president has spoken about the importance of club planning. Uh, others may have alluded to it, but it was nice to have that nice clear statement. Um, and you also mentioned broad, right? In strategic, yeah. so what, what, what do you mean by broad? Or can you elaborate on that? But I, I was sort of elaborating on it when I used the word fundamental. So foundational issues that um, I suppose an example could be um, growing the footprint of a club uh, by increasing membership, increasing diversity, and so forth. How you how you are planning to accomplish that? Yeah. Be an example. I like. Uh, I think you said getting to the core. Yeah. says something like that yes yeah. yeah and i think that's really important um if a club is struggling 
instead of just band-aids, which again, band-aids are better than not, what's the core of our struggle? And if we can figure out what the core of the struggle is, we can address it with something that's gonna likely bear more fruit than a Band-Aid would. Great, thank you. Uh, any other comments on what strategic means? I love. Oh, go ahead. High level. And what do you mean by high level? You're not getting into the, the guts of it or the details of it. It's, um, I guess the way I think of it in my head is, it's setting out your, your, um, your destination, but not your roadmap. Using the broad strokes. Yeah. So uh, this is great, thank you. We're gonna talk about implementing plans, which kind of gets into the later phase. When we get into implementation, there will be occasions when we do get into the guts and the weeds, but we don't start with the guts and the weeds. We start high level, broad strokes, big issues, and then we get down into the meat after that. And there's kind of a, a flow from like broad to narrow. If you start with narrow, you're likely not going to get broad. It'll just stay narrow. Jeff? You, yes. Laura has her hand up. Just oh, I'm to... sorry. Go ahead. So, so Jeff, I was just going to say, starting with the end in mind and oh. without preconceived ideas about how you're going to get there. I love it. Thank you. And I'm sorry I missed your hand. It's okay. Start with the end in mind. That is very, well, everything you've all said is strategic. That is very strategic. Start with the end in mind. And, and going back to what we were saying before, that end in mind is not necessarily the end of this upcoming rotary year. It may be three to five years, 10 years. But if you start with the end in mind, you're not gonna be doing band-aids in all likelihood. You're gonna be looking at that high level, broad stroke kind of approach and then um, get into the meat. That's excellent. And by the way, because um, I, I, I do this in my, in my profession, it is not easy for people to think starting with the end in mind. They think front load everything, push, push, push. And I keep saying, okay, but if you push, uh, uh, Greg Pod, who some of you know, uh, past Rotary International Vice President, good friend. He said to me, he said, Jeff, this thing we're working on, it's like pushing a rope. It's better to start with the end in mind and pull the rope. That's why, that's why Greg is a genius. Okay, so we have a sense of strategic. So again, one-year plan is great compared to no plan. It's great. It's, it's good to have a plan. But if you can, and for those of you who are presidents elect, or I think we have a president elect elect, if you can think longer term, you'll find that it'll be more successful. And if you're gonna think longer term, and if you are the incoming president, you've got a couple of weeks before you're gonna be president, it's important to have your successor on board because what you don't want is a three-year plan and next year, the president says, well, I, I'm not, I don't buy into that. So we're just going to start all, start all over, right? So you want to try to have as much buy-in over that period of time with the leadership at the time as possible. Okay, excellent. Thank you. So for the rest of uh, the next hour and 10 minutes, we're going to really try to focus on strategic planning, if at all possible, okay? Uh, Jeff, yes. If I, if I could make a comment about buy-in, I think the buy-in has got to include the the broad membership, because it's the membership yeah. that endures year after year after year, not just the next, you know, the president they left. But I would agree. It, but if the incoming leadership, so let's put by, I would agree with you. Mm -hmm. But if the leadership doesn't, they will fight it. Then that's right. And they will, you know, I mean, you could have a, a quite a tussle, right? But I, I do agree in principle, you want, you want buy-in from the whole membership. Absolutely. Let's just add that. Yeah, I, I'd like to add 
and Steve, that's a great point. But I, uh, I think that you know the the plan is is built by the leadership, and then it's uh, and then it's sold to the members, uh, and why why the leadership has developed the plan and what they want to accomplish, and then then they inspire the membership to get on board to implement the plan. Okay, excellent discussion. Thank you. So let's look at the first phase. Planning the plan, pre-planning, whatever you want to say. Um, for those of you who've been involved in planning efforts, what are some of the key steps that should be done in preparation for, and you know, we'll just say it's strategic planning for the club. What are some of the key steps? In my experience, we've always done SWATs. And can you, uh, can you tell us what the SWAT acronym is? Um, oh, now you're, <laughs> I'll, I'll start typing strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Excellent. Except for my uh, type. Yep. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So can you explain what strengths without going into a lot of detail, what yeah. we mean by strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, why there's four of them? You're really looking for what you want to focus on during your, your strategic planning. Um, so it's, you know, what are the things you want to continue doing? What are the things you need to change? Um, and, and what's your environment that you're working within? Okay. Um, what I would add to that, so that's great. What I would add to that is that strengths and weaknesses typically are internal things. And opportunities and threats are typically external things. COVID was a threat. And in fact, in some ways, it's an opportunity. And that's one of the things we're looking at is what benefit are we getting from this horrible event that unfolded, right? So COVID was external. Strengths and weaknesses tend to be internal. What is our club doing well? What are areas where our club can improve? So SWAT looks at both internal and external factors. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Jeff? Yes. Who does this? Is it just the leadership? Is it the leadership with select members? I mean, who starts this whole process off? What a great question, Steve. Um, before I give you my uh, uh, input, because I'm just facilitating, who, for those of you who are involved in planning, who does this? The board, usually. Everyone, if you can. I mean, to do a survey, to get out and find what other people are thinking is mm -hmm. critical if yeah. you want buy in. It's so interesting I, when you ask that, Steve, because because part of what you want to figure out when you're preparing to plan is who needs to be involved, right? So there's not one way that it's always done. It depends. Uh, and I think what we should do is kind of identify the types of people that could be involved. And again, there's not like it has to be done this way. So uh, one of you mentioned the board and, and let's, let's just be clear, could be current and incoming, right? Could be. Sure. And, and the membership, and one of you mentioned as an example, getting member feedback. And we'll talk about that um, a little more detail. Who else may be involved? Jeff? Yes. I look at the board as, of course, our clubs are generally board driven, at least the initiator of whatever uh, process you're going to take in your planning, uh, because the club does look to the board for that type of leadership. As uh, far as the details, like you say, there are different ways to approach it. Right. So, what do, do, uh, do we should we just add here that the board typically is an initiator? Is that what you're saying, Tom? I look at that that yeah. way. I would agree. And we have a chat that just came down. Perfect, Laura. So, yes. Laura, would you unmute and and speak what you chatted, please? So I said the community and partners because we can't 
plan in a vacuum. We have to know that what we're planning to do will benefit those intended recipients. God, that is, uh, let's see, were you the one that I was supposed to give the star to? No, that was um, Christine. I'm sorry. Okay, so we'll, we'll assume that Christine said that so I can give her a star. Uh, that's great. So um, thank you, Laura. <laughs> yeah. So look, uh, this is this is something that we typically don't think about. We, we tend to look inward when we're doing planning, but sometimes it's good to look outward. If your club has a relationship in the community, an organization or several that your club tends to work with, it's cool to include them. Now, you're not including, let's say, the entire organization, but maybe one or two representatives. Um, it's, it's, we talked about insightful planning. Oftentimes, the insight comes from the outside people. The inside people tend to be in their comfort zone, they're in their box. But if you bring in the community and the partners, oftentimes what they contribute in planning is not what the club was thinking because they're different. They have a different perspective. That's great. That, that's where you find your opportunities and threats. That's exactly right. Um, so yeah, that's great. I, and uh, I don't know how many of you are in small clubs, but small clubs have a challenge sometimes putting together a group that's large enough so you have a diversity of points of view and a diversity of opinion. Well, so let's say you're a club of six people. If you invite some of those community partners, it also adds more to your planning group, right? So small clubs often really could use the feedback and the input from the community partners because they're fairly small to start. Excellent. Um, who else? Anyone else? Maybe you could have somebody from another club, you know, see like to hear like what they've done. I love that. Uh, share best practices. There you go. Um, perhaps your assistant governor. I mean, whether they're from another club or not, oftentimes they are, and in, in that way they kind of serve two roles. They're from another club, and as, an, as your club's assistant governor, they also have a vested interest in your club's success, right? For those of you folks that may not be in uh, 5520, we have worked recently to, uh, there have been some longstanding uh, club presidents meetings uh, that they meet once a month. And then also we're developing some that, uh, so the, the rest of the district has those because we are kind of spread out and they're on Zoom these days, but something to think about. Yeah. you know. If anything, and I, I appreciate the discussion on this, if anything, when, when, if you're in a position where you need to kind of convene a group, don't just look inward. Um, and if you look outward, try to identify people who have a legitimate vested interest in your club's success and who know things about your club. Okay, excellent. All right. So I hope we answered your question, Steve, about who does this. And again, it's not, it's not like every single time a club does planning, it's exactly the same in terms of people, but these are the types of people and types of groups that you would consider if you're gonna do some kind of strategic plan. Absolutely, good discussion. Thank you, everybody. You got it. Yeah. Yes. You, you, you hit on something that I've been thinking about since you said strategic plan about about open and you know getting diverse opinions. I my school district back home in Ohio, like 20 years ago, they decided they needed a strategic plan, and they advertised for community members, and I volunteered. And it turned out, it seemed, it felt like to me at least, 
it was all a farce because the administration appointed the chair of a committee. It was all somebody in the, in the school. And then there was on top of that another, what I called minder. So it felt like they already made up their mind what they wanted to do. And, but like best practices said, you should get the community involved, but I didn't feel involved well at all. I felt like the superintendent and the school board already knew what they wanted. And we were just there to rubber stamp. And I, I, it was just, I, I felt, I felt sort of used in the process. Yeah. I mean, I, I can, I can empathize, you know, if, if a club is going to go through, this is, there's a lot of work involved here and people have a passion. I don't know about you all, but generally speaking, Rotarians are passionate people. And if they're going to be asked to participate in something like this, they want to know that it's value added time, not that it's just formality. Right. Um, what a, what a way to disengage people by including them in some kind of process like this and then just have it be, you know, well, it doesn't really matter. I already know what we're going to do. And that's, that's, that's unfortunate. Sorry. <clears throat> Jeff. Yes. It, it seems important to mention that it isn't only passionate Rotarians who want their meeting time to make a difference. You really don't want to have a meeting unless you've got a purpose for the meeting and everyone sure. is involved. Well, and what about the community and partners that you're including? Right, what exactly. What time for them? Precisely. Okay. Um, Jeff, yes. I think, I don't know if you're going to cover it later, but what Michael just said is, in my mind, is really critical, and that's part of the process should not be coming in with a hidden agenda or an agenda, period. Right. We are going to talk about that. But let me let me jot it down, because okay. there's a whole section on don't come in with hidden Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna get into that. That's next. By the way, no surprise here. There's as much consideration in preparing than there is in planning. In fact, in some ways, I think there's more. So it's 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 like everything else in life. You know, if you invest the time up front, it pays off down the road. If you don't invest the time up front, you struggle and, and everything becomes a crisis and, and reactive. So the fact that we're spending a lot of time in pre-planning is in part because there's a lot to consider in pre-planning. So, uh, so we've got more to do. Okay, let's go back to getting member feedback because that was something we were also gonna cover. So um, in your materials, there's the notion of uh, member survey. I'm a big fan of member surveys. I'm not a big fan of the one in your materials. It's too long. Um, but again, there's no perfect survey. It really depends on what information your club needs from the membership. So we've already talked about some of them. What's working well? Uh, when I was club president, I didn't want to assume I knew what was working well. I knew I wanted to ask the membership what's working well. And believe me, they were, they were not the same. What do we need to improve? What ideas do you have? What do you like? Um, so it is recommended that as part of a strategic planning process, there's some kind of member feedback or survey. Jeff? Yes. Also, you're talking about hidden agenda. I think when you're getting comments from your members and, and get, gathering information is there's no restriction on can we do that or can't do that or feasibility at this point. You're trying to get a broad spectrum of thoughts and ideas through the planning process on down it. You're going to determine feasibility of doing some projects. So, so you want everybody to feel unrestrained in making comments and, and ideas. Yes. It's an excellent point, and again, we will um, we will really hit on that um, in a few minutes. Um, and in fact, it's a little bit here. Uh, if you have experience with doing member surveys, it's I think it's really important that they feel like they can be open and honest in their responses, which kind of goes to Tom's point. And to me, the only way you can really uh, ensure that they feel that they can be open and honest is if it's done anonymously. 
Now, if you, if you ask for their name, I'm not saying that that's wrong. All I'm saying is if they, if they're required to give their name or if it's part of the process, subconsciously, they may think to themselves, I'm going to be a little bit reserved in my responses because there could be repercussions and there could. So it's just a, it's just a recommendation. Uh, if you're going to do this, especially if you really want to get that open and honest feedback, like Tom was saying, consider uh, doing it anonymously. Uh, especially like our club is a smaller one, you know, and you start saying certain things you don't like, you know, it's probably people are going to, well, I know who exactly who you're talking about. Right. And, you know. <laughs> right. Um, another consideration with getting feedback is it's not something you have to do all the time, but it should be done sometimes. So if you're the incoming president and your term starts July 1st and the current president did a survey this past year and the membership really hasn't changed that much, then maybe you don't need to do another one. It's not like it has to be done every year. If you want that insight, that's fine. But again, you don't want to just overwhelm them and it's like, oh, another survey. I mean, you can get survey fatigue like we have Zoom fatigue now, right? So it may not be done every year, but it should be done every couple of years because things do change, interests and membership and so on. So again, something to think about. Another thing that's really, I think, important to think about is uh, the demographics of your membership. Um, and again, there's no right or wrong. Uh, I'll give you what, what I, I like to use and then you can tell me what you've used or what you like to use. But when, when I've done member surveys, I would ask, it's anonymous, but I would say, uh, what is your gender, your age, and how many years you've been in Rotary? Those, those three things. I knew going in, that after everyone responded that I wanted to pull apart the male and, male and female and see if there was any difference. And there was uh, age, we did it in like 10 year increments, you know, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, 40 to 50. And there were differences in what they liked and what they didn't based on age demographics. Okay, we'll, and we'll get to you, uh, Laura, in a second. That's a really good point. And then the third one was uh, years in Rotary, because sometimes what we've seen is when people join Rotary, they have certain interests and expectations, but then as they stay in Rotary for, let's say, five to 10 years, they shift. So those were the three I asked. Uh, Laura, why don't you go ahead and unmute and uh, kind of reinforce what you put in the chat, please. Oh, sure. No, I was just putting that out there that we, we kept the, the survey this year very short. Yeah. Um, we've, we've tried phone surveys, we've tried different ways because sometimes people don't respond to us sending out surveys, but um, we actually got a good response from this year. We kept the questions very short, very limited. It didn't take more than a minute for people to fill it out. And it was just basically the big thing we wanted to know. Can we go back to in-person meetings? Do you guys yes. feel comfortable with it? Or do you want hybrid? And they chose hybrid, so. Focus on what's important. You know, um, in the goals, in the uh, materials, it talks about analyzing. And in fact, this module used to be called strategic planning and analysis. And I'm unhappy that they dropped the and analysis part. Well, why ask questions in a survey if you don't have an intent to analyze the results? What's the point? Focus on what's important. And if what's important is, are we going to shift to hybrid meetings, then ask that. But don't ask questions that you don't have, and I shouldn't say you, it's anyone. Don't ask questions that you don't have an intent to analyze. Because just like we said before, it's like pushing a rope. It's like, what's, what's the point if you're not gonna analyze the data? Uh, that goes with the, uh, start with the end in mind. What are we trying to figure out? And ask questions accordingly. Okay, that was a little preachy, sorry. Okay. Uh, let's go back to Tom's point. Tom, don't come in with, yes. Did I hear something? I coughed, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. You don't need to, <laughs> you don't need to apologize. Uh, don't come in with a hidden agenda. So in terms of planning, and we're going to shift to 
the planning part in a second. We're, we're almost done with this, but um, what what does that mean, Tom? What um, can you kind of elaborate on how in a preparation for planning, you wanna make sure that we don't have hidden agendas? Well, it's real easy to uh, discount things if you have a hidden agenda, things you really want uh, yourself. Uh, you, you may be based on something that didn't work before or did not work. And this is where you want to present to people when you're talking. If they have an idea, you're not going to say, well, oh, that won't work or this won't work uh, to, to, to give the confidence of expressing uh, thoughts uh, because something may work that didn't work before. So you want to make sure your membership is and or whoever you're, you're talking to has a feeling of they can say what they think. Yep. And then you're going to take it and put it in some kind of box or some concrete approach to see if some of those things can be accomplished. So if it's okay, um, as you were talking, I, I jotted down two notes. Leave pride at the door. Is that okay? Correct. And be open to new ideas. New ideas and even old ideas that have been discarded. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's do one more thing then. Let's can go I back. Add, yes. add to that, uh, Jeff? Yes. I, I think you probably need to have some rules of engagement. Yes. Uh, you know, like nobody, if somebody says something, you know, don't say no or don't say, well, that's not going to work. Or you, you have to Correct. agree going into that. Otherwise, um, you know, how do you enforce that? Yeah. And we'll talk about that in a second. There's a couple of models I've seen that work really well. But I want to go back yeah. to who does this. That's a that's good idea. Yeah. So one thing that came to mind when you mentioned be open to new ideas, and I've seen this uh, with clubs and I love it, is they'll bring in a new member to be part of the planning. Um, no bias, no pride, or very little. Uh, they don't know about the old ideas because they weren't in the club then. And kind of like with the community and partners, they have an outside perspective, even though they're members now, because they weren't in the club all that time. So it's interesting to think about including new a new member. Um, and one other thing we should add, since we've got uh, Jessica on, as part of our community and partners, uh, Rotaract would be a great example. If your club sponsors a Rotaract club, include a Rotaractor in your planning, that's another thought. Okay. Jeff, I'd like to add to that, boy, yep. that comment you just made there, bringing new people in uh, to the board, uh, and it really sort of feeds into diversity and equity and inclusion. Diversity, you know, is improved by getting the, you know, young members on, on board and with the uh, strategic planning committee, but inclusiveness means valuing their opinion and not just saying, and it sort of goes to what Michael said, you know, getting them on board is one thing, but, uh, but honoring and respecting their opinions and uh, being inclusive of their opinions is important as well. Absolutely. Jeff? Yes. Also with all these comments you're getting from people that are giving ideas, you may find a new leader that uh, yes. they have a, something they wanna do and they, they can make it work. So your, your group needs yeah. to always look at those things. So just think about how much we've already considered and we haven't even started planning yet. Um, one other one I'd like to cover quickly. Uh, there are other things to review in preparation for planning other than if you're gonna do a member survey. Um, we all know about Rotary Club Central, right? Does anyone not know about Rotary Club Central? Okay, I, well. I Sorry, I'm not familiar with that. You are not? Okay. So Rotary International, rotary.org has a beautiful section of their website that you can access if you're a member and you've got your login, which provides you with club data, like membership trends, giving to the foundation, uh, hours spent on service projects, public image activities. What better opportunity I mean, why have all that data out there if we're not going to use it, right? So let's call it past club data 
for example, through Rotary Club Central. How's the club been doing in membership the last five years, right? Trends are important for planning. It's part of that SWOT analysis, right? If the trends have been going down over the last five years, that's not a strength, right? And the plan would look very different if the last five years had a downward membership trend than if the last five years, the club had a, an upward membership trend. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Does that, does that seem reasonable? So part of preparation is aggregating and putting together relevant past data and not 20 years ago past, recent past. How have we been doing? And all of that feeds into what you've already talked about. For the people that are gonna be participating, how have we been doing? If we've been doing really well, maybe the plan is stay the course. You know, so I would just add that as another consideration. Again, there's a lot to cover here, but I think we made a good start. Okay, let's shift to planning. By the way, this, we could have done this for three or four hours and, and, and still not cover everything, but uh, okay, let me move this down. So now we've done all this preparation and we're ready to start planning. So now we're in the room or we're on Zoom or we're hybrid, however it's working. We've got the people, we've got the information, and now we start. What elements need to be included or should be included in the actual planning or in the plan itself? It's gonna be the outcome of our work. So for the actual planning, you need a way to facilitate it. Okay. Well, let's put up here, we want to identify how it's going to be facilitated before the meeting, right? Is that correct? So I think up in the pre-planning, we should decide who's going to facilitate. Is that okay? If we have it in pre-planning? Sure. Okay. Does everyone understand what that means? Or the different, you know, are you gonna bring in someone from the outside to facilitate it? Is someone from the club gonna do it? Is the incoming president gonna do it? Is the assistant governor gonna do it? Is district governor Bob gonna do it? Who's, who's gonna facilitate? And again, there's no, there's no one way, it really just depends. But someone needs, to run, someone needs to run this. It depends on the purpose of this meeting. Right. Is the outcome of this meeting going to be the final boom? This is what we're going to do. Or is this the final brainstorm to get it finalized down to the proposal to present back to the club? Okay, so I'm gonna jot down what you said. Could be final or could be draft to go to membership. Did I capture what you said? Yeah. Okay, that's a valid point. Uh, what we've talked about before is that we want to have membership buy-in, right? Right. So if it is final, or if that's the intent, and the membership doesn't like it, we've got a problem. Right. Uh, I've seen it both. Seems to, yeah, go ahead. It seems to me maybe you could like, you know, have your new committee come up with some initial like goals and then like come back to the, and say, hey, this is what we're thinking of. Did we miss something? Yep. And then, you know, then you, then you, they could work on like developing the plan, how to get to the goals. So that way you don't get like, here's the final draft and it's too late to add anything. Right. You know, it's like, yeah, they've approved it, but like you didn't really have any say. I think maybe coming back midway might, might be helpful. Yeah. I think the, um, there's, there's some possible traps here. Let's say you've got some members who are incredibly vocal and typically don't agree with the club direction and they were not included in this meeting. So the, the planning group does its work, present it to the membership and this vocal person says, oh, this is a bunch of hooey. 
or we tried that 10 years ago and it didn't work. So, on. so you, whoever's doing this, you need to be cognizant. Of, and they were not included in this meeting for a reason. Right. Well, so if they were not included, then there has to be some understanding or what do we do if we roll it out to the membership and we get a few of these crusty um, people say, well, that doesn't make sense and I'm not going to buy into that. Uh, it, it could it could sabotage a little bit. Okay, we've got some hand raises. Uh, Laura, go ahead. So what I have found in my experience, not necessarily with Rotary, but working in government where I have to go present to sometimes very vocal opponents of things is that I pre-meet with them before I take it to the group because you know you, you aren't always going to get buy-in, but if you can answer most of their objections and hard questions in private, um, a lot of times that makes everything go pro go easier for everybody when you take it to the group as a whole. But I do love Michael's idea of taking it back to everybody to see because we're an entire club and you know yep. we want buy-in from you know as much of the club as possible. Totally agree. This is this is great. You guys are doing great. Um, I have, having worked with my my county commission and we have we have a, a, a small group of regulars I call them that come to our meetings and some of them it's like everything we do is suspect and you know and it's um, you know I don't, I don't know sometimes you wish maybe you could like if you'd ask me some questions maybe I could have told you that it's not this evil conspiracy that you think it is um, you know and I'm sure you know, I have 65,000 citizens in my county, but every organization has at least a few people like that, that like everything is suspect, you know? Um, and it's, it's, it's really hard to deal with them because it's just like they're, that, that's, they live to say no to things. Yeah. It's, and you know, it's, um, it's a very interesting dynamic. I've seen situations where they were brought in early to be part of it. I've seen where, like Laura said, people would meet with them in private and say, look, you know, we really want your buy-in on this. You're really important. We want, you know, and, and just try to soothe, calm, whatever the term is, so that they don't go ballistic when they see a plan they don't agree with. It's just tricky business. I will say one thing, uh, and then we'll move on, uh, just to reinforce what you all said, and we've got a few incoming presidents. One thing we recommend when we do president-like training is Use the year that you're a president-elect to get to know your membership, if you don't already. Who are the naysayers? Who are the, who, who are the enthusiastic ones? Who are the ones that say a lot of stuff and then don't do anything, right? If you use that year to really get to know the membership, their personalities, kind of how they fit in, it will help with things like this. That way you're, you're less surprised you can still be surprised, but in all likelihood, you're less surprised because you spent that time to really understand them. Okay. Uh, yes, it's so interesting. Uh, so great point, Sonny. Upset people are engaged, aren't they? But they're engaged the wrong way. They're not apathetic. They're engaged in a negative way. And you want to understand that. And, and again, just be open about it. Um, boy, great discussion. Okay. All right. Back to the plan. Let's go to the goals. And the uh, manual talks about this a little bit. Uh, there is an acronym, acronym that we typically use with goals. Does anyone know about SMART goals? Yeah. Okay. Um, Specific, measurable, attainable, um, I can't remember what the R is in time. Relevant. Relevant in time. Yeah. Yep. Or something similar to that. Yep. Um, and again, Rotary Club Central is great because if used, it kind of forces us to think about smart goals. They've got to be specific. They've got to be measurable because that's what you're putting in Rotary Club Central is how are we doing? Um, Attainable, and that's one we'll talk about in a second. Uh, they should be relevant, like, well, why are we doing this? If you get a bunch of why are we doing this when you uh, roll out the plan, you've got a problem. And then time bound. And again, 
strategic planning typically is not is not one year, but there's one year stuff under it. So maybe it's a three to five year plan. And in the first year, we're gonna do this. And in the second year, we're gonna do that. So it's a great acronym. It's easy to remember. Um, and again, I think, I think Rotary kind of sets up uh, kind of using the notion of SMART goals. Um, Attainable is one that there's room to differ in terms of how attainable, like uh, getting up this morning was an attainable goal for me. Um, if, if clubs wanna be successful, they should set goals that are attainable, but not just by breathing. There still has to be some work involved, right? Uh, like, I, I guess you'd call it a little bit of a stretch, reach. Um, if our club, if, if we're setting a membership goal and we're at 10 members, if we set a goal to stay at 10, that may be very reasonable, especially if the last five years, the trend was downward. That would make a lot of sense to me. Keep it at 10 because the last few years we've lost members. If on the other hand, the last few years we've gained in members, why set a goal that says we're not going to grow? So that's why some of that past data is helpful. Is that, is that reasonable? Um, and as some of you've noted, when you're getting buy-in from the club, which you want, if you set goals that are not attainable and you therefore don't achieve them, there is a tendency for people to get down on that, to be unhappy. We, want, we don't want Rotarians to be unhappy. We want them to be driven. So if you set too high a goal and you don't achieve it, sometimes no matter what you say, people are just going to say, oh, you know, oh, we tried. But if you set an attainable goal and maybe you uh, go beyond it, people get really excited. And part of what we need is we need engaged, motivated members of the club. So it is something to think about. Jeff, I'd like to... to add to that yep. about attainability is um, is kind of a squishy term. You know, 30 years ago, you know, when Rotary International said we're gonna eliminate polio, that might have seemed unattainable to many people. We're almost there. Um, and so, you know, I've, I've always advocated to have audacious goals. Uh, some people may say, well, that's not attainable. Even if you don't attain it, you might come close and, and, and you will have improved and remember that also that your goals can be changed over time. You don't, they're not chiseled in stone either. Well, I love the word audacious. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a term called the BHAG. I don't know if you've heard of that. It's the big, hairy, audacious goal. Some big thing. Um, that's pretty cool if your club has a big, hairy, audacious goal. Uh, and maybe that takes maybe that takes twenty years to accomplish. Audacious goals. I don't know about you, Bob, but audacious goals typically take time to accomplish them, right? Okay. Uh, I'd say right. Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but it's not a bad idea to have a really long-term goal. Like, boy, you know what? In 10, 20 years, we're going to be this. And, Jeff, and would, you meantime, add be, would you add BHAG to the audacious? Because sure. it's worth remembering. That is where a lot of energy comes when people buy into a BHAG. Jeff, there was a, a club recently, I don't recall if it was Albuquerque, I think it was Albuquerque, that they set up a goal to, to get to a $1 million for their foundation. That was, yeah. They just did. So, yeah. yep. That well, was a long, that was a 20 year goal. That was a, that was a, in uh, Bruce, remind me, that was in, uh, that was like near when the club started and it was a 2020 goal. It had a time frame of by 2020, we're going to have a million dollars in our foundation. Yeah, it's, it actually started uh, in 2000. We had the, our club was, was founded in 1997. And it, we started talking about it in 2000, but it, was, it wasn't until 2002 
that we actually set the goal and decided how we were going to do it by, through the governor's ball. And it, like you said, it was, well, yeah, it, 20 year, it wasn't exactly a 20 year goal. I don't, I, we talked about it in, in 2000, but I don't think we really did anything about it until a couple of years later. Um, okay, excellent point. There's one other thing I'd like to add before we move on to the post planning. So remember the title of this session and what we discussed up here is strategic, right? This is strategic planning. So for me, your humble facilitator, I think it's reasonable to have strategies in a strategic plan. Does everyone agree? We Absolutely. Do. <laughs> so um, what we talked about what strategic means in terms of the elements of a plan, what would a strategy be or how would you describe what a strategy is in a strategic plan? What is it? What is its purpose in a plan? Jeff? Yes. I always looked at, particularly in, in my doing therapy even, it's methods. How yes. are you going to do it? And materials, what you need. Agreed. Um, any other thoughts on what encompasses or what reinforces the notion of strategies in a strategic plan? People involved. Got to have people. Can't do it without people. And, and if I could share a small example that I like to use in classes, um, you don't want to throw out dumb ideas, quote unquote. Um, for example, if somebody is trying to figure out how to get ice off the top of a telephone pole and they say, well, you know, if we put a pot of honey up there on the top of the telephone pole and the bears will come out and they'll climb up and they'll get the pot of honey and they'll knock the um, ice off the telephone pole and instead of saying, oh, that's a dumb idea, you say something like, well, how would we get the pots of honey up there? And somebody says, well, then we bring in helicopters to put the pots of honey up there and you come back and you say, huh, well, you know, if we have helicopters going up there, why don't they just free ice melt? <laughs> and you've got a, a, a good solution. Yeah. So don't throw out the dumb ideas because you never know where they're going to lead. Well, and what, what I like about your example is people added to the idea to make it a, a better idea, right? There was engagement, brainstorming, whatever you want to call that to get to what made sense. Perfect. Um, okay. So... In terms of strategies, there's a question that's often asked. So we think about like what, why, who, there's a, there's a question that is often the key question that lends itself to understanding strategies. I'll just type it out. It's the how question. Because goals don't have how usually. Goals are what? We're gonna we're gonna go from fifteen to twenty members next year. We're gonna raise twenty five thousand dollars for the Rotary Foundation. The goals tend to be what's, but we need to have hows. How are we gonna accomplish these goals? Right. Here's the here's the key. Where is it? Uh, okay, right here. High level, not getting into the guts and the weeds, right? We talked about that in terms of what strategic means. So the notion of asking how in strategic planning is not getting into the guts and weeds. It's still high level, big picture. But ultimately, when we get into the third phase, we still have to get into guts and weeds. So as I'll, uh, so I'll, I'll ask you all for examples first. So what would be an example of a strategy that would be developed in strategic planning that accomplishes the notion of it being high level, not getting into the guts and weeds, but addressing the how question. What would be an example of a strategy, any strategy that you think would come out of a strategic plan that stays at that high level? It, it could be, be like about membership, foundation, I'm sorry, go ahead. 
No, I would it be like creating like a committee? Like if you're thinking, if you're going to increase membership, so then you're like, well, we got to focus or make sure we give more to the committee that handles membership. And so that's still high level. You're not doing the how, but you're kind of putting a mode into place, but not really like the guts and the weeds. So maybe, you know, uh, dedicating that specialty for whatever you want to accomplish. And that's great. And I think um, if I understand what you're saying, and we'll get to Laura's in a second, the guts and the weeds may be done by that committee, right? Yes. Figure correct. out the nuts and bolts. What are we going to do this week? Correct. So if, if right. what you want to do is increase membership, then you say, okay, then we need to dedicate the committee that's going to do membership and either give it more not necessarily more power, but more, more members for it to be more, more um, visibility in the club. So if this is the, the goal is to increase membership, then we're going to give it to the committee, the membership committee, but make the membership committee like the number one committee amongst all of them, if that's the goal. And then they will handle how to bring in people and all that other stuff. That is uh, profound. Um, and critical. If your club doesn't have effective committees, it's going to be very hard to implement this plan. Not impossible, but someone's got to do those nuts and bolts, weeds, detail stuff. And in a sense, that's why committees exist, is to accomplish things but they typically accomplish things under this high level plan that we're trying to develop, right? So yeah, and we're gonna get to the, in the third part, we've got uh, 20 minutes left. The, the, key, the key role of these committees to implement the plan. Um, Laura, you had an example in the chat, another example? Sure, I, I was saying if we engage community partners Yep. as a high level strategy on how we're going to do things, we may get a lot of the details on how we're going to do things from our community partners. Perfect. You see it, so I wanna make sure everyone understands the difference. Engaging community partners answers the how question, right? How are we gonna do something? Engage community partners is how we're gonna do it. Where's the detail? Not here. Others will figure that out. And what we're going to do is we're going to give them this charge after we get buy-in from the membership that says our overall strategy to accomplish something is going to be engaging community partners. And we'll leave it up to you all to figure out the nuts and bolts detail and so on. And that'll be, the, that'll be how we implement the plan. Um, any other examples of kind of a high level strategy that can be relevant to a Rotary Club? Could be for any goal. We increase fundraising opportunities. For events okay. or something. Right, so it's very high level, no detail. It answers a how question. And I like that it says increase opportunities. If it said increase our giving, that's a what? That's like a goal. But if we talk about increasing opportunities for fundraising, that's more like a strategy, right? Okay. Do you see the difference? Okay. Excellent. All right, in the 20 minutes we have left, let's get to post plan. So this includes implementing the plan, adjusting if needed, and a few other things. By the way, uh, we do have a couple of presidents elect today, correct? Um, is this helpful? It's not overwhelming, is it? Okay. Post planning, rubber meets the road. We've done all this work. We've done the surveys. We've looked at the past data. We convened a group. We did all this stuff. We developed a plan. What do we do now? Execute the plan? Execute the plan. 
or implement the plan. Right. Assign responsibilities. Yes. I'm going to include that in here because that's part of implementing, right? Okay. Um, have a feedback loop or um, a way of, um, I guess back to your smart goals, a way of measuring. Right. Okay, boy, this, you guys are great. Um, okay, let's, let's take them one at a time like we did before and kind of uh, peel the onion a little bit. Uh, defining responsibilities. So we talked before about committees. Um, how many, uh, I'll just ask one or two of you, how many committees does your club have? And I'm not talking subcommittees because some, some of your clubs may be really large and you may have subcommittees, but higher level, how many committees does your club have roughly? Like seven. Okay, seven, that's a nice number. Um, do you know Christine, if each of the committees has a dedicated goal that it's working on? Because I think we talked about that before that when well, we established- Yeah, basically, yeah. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm, so you're like seven committees, each one kind of has a goal it's focusing on that lends itself to the idea of like seven-ish goals or each committee has something specific to work on that came out of the plan. How's that? Is yes. that reasonable? Okay. So here's, here's the lesson learned. Each committee has something to work on that comes from the plan. So just think about that for a second. Each committee has something to work on that comes from the plan, whether it's a goal or a strategy, whatever you're going to call it. How awesome would that be if each committee had something specific to work on that came from the plan? As opposed to just being a committee. You know, we talked about focusing quite a bit in what we talked about before. If a committee doesn't have something specific from the plan to work on, what is it doing then? And how is it helping the club accomplish its goals? Every committee should in part be helping the club accomplish goals. The question is how, right? So this is a big opportunity to really accomplish two things. It handles the defining responsibilities part and it gives committees something to focus on. Uh, any feedback on that? So, uh, we've got a, a couple of current and past presidents. Do you find that this is helpful to have committees have something they can rally around that came from the plan that the club developed? Jeff? Yep. There's a subtle distinction between working on something and working from it. Mm -hmm. And and basically, it comes down to, I think, having the committee not just working on something, but having its own smart goal that comes from the plan. Mm -hmm. So that they're standing with the end in mind. Right. But, they're, but it's coming from the plan. It's not their own goal. Precisely. Yep. It's a, we, we often call that cascading goals. You know, yeah. the, the organization sets goals and then it's like, okay, membership committee. Here's our big plan. What's your piece? What's your specific goal, if you want to call it that, that's underneath right. kind of the high level? Yeah. This is so important. And I've, I've seen so many instances where clubs have committees, the committees do work, and it's good work. The problem is the work isn't necessarily aligned to the plan that the club came up with. And it's like, okay. Well, that's fine. We're glad you're doing work, but it's not going to be as productive and as valuable if the work is not aligned to the plan that we're supposed to be working under. And Jeff, I, yes. I was I was president this past year, and I'm going to be president next year. And 
when I went down the Rotary International website and I saw the, you know, you're supposed to put in your goals for the year. Yep. And so I was really thoughtful when I did that. But then when I, I, I wrote them all out and then I presented them to our club so that they knew, Hey, this is what I'm considering. Does this seem reasonable? Cause I wanted them to have a buy-in yeah. because if they thought, no, we can't raise that much money for the foundation. Nobody said that I would try to be really thoughtful. Cause I had looked back on Rotary Club Central to see how much had we given the year before I actually doubled it, but we did it. We, we were able to do it. Yeah. And, but, I, but then I gave them updates like in March, Hey, we haven't met the goal yet. Let's, you know, when let, let's, let's kind of dig into our pockets. You said you would help me attain this goal. Help me. And we, and we made it this month. And so that's, awesome. that's how I did it because we wanted to get, I wanted to, and as a former club, just a club member, I didn't know where we ever were with our goals because nobody had ever done that before. And it's like, I missed that. I missed that f feedback back to the regular club members. And so I thought, no, I don't want to, I want to make sure that I'm giving them that feedback. So we did it. So um, that's so awesome. Um, we have yeah, talked. But, but, but Christine uh, says that that touches a nerve with me because in my office, when I moved into this job three years ago, on my bookshelves, I inherited a bunch of long term plans that the county had spent a lot of money on a, uh, a, a like a, a like a plan for development, a water plan. And like, I've never heard anything about any of these plans. We paid consultants a bunch of money for these plans, but like, I don't know what the goals are. I don't know where we're at on it. I don't know if it was just we commissioned it because somebody at the state said we had to have it, you know, but yeah, I, that's, a, yeah, you, you need to keep people informed, like monitor it because, uh, yeah, I, 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 like I said, I see that, that there's three or four plans on my shelf that are just dust collectors. Yeah, just, uh, you know, just collecting dust, like you said. Um, oh, that's great. I agree. Um, so this, this last one that you all mentioned is, I mean, all of this stuff to me is really important, but if you're not measuring progress, again, what's the point? And why have something as beautiful as Rotary Club Central that gets populated either by your club secretary or automatically with your membership and your foundation and your all that, why even do that if we're not gonna be using it to monitor progress? And I've seen so many instances when Rotary Club Central is collecting dust. I'm like, well, why even populate a database with, with goal information if the club isn't gonna be monitoring it and saying, well, how are we doing? And by the way, not every strategy is going to work. And we know a strategy is not gonna work if we're not seeing progress towards a goal. Why keep doing it? Right, why keep doing it? change it, right? Don't keep doing the same thing over and over. It's not working. That's where the adjustment comes in. Keep it fluid. Um, so we've got 10 minutes left. I, I, uh, for RLI facilitators, and a number of you are, we are trained not to talk about ourselves. We are facilitating, okay? The only exception I will make in this session is, and it, it, cause it worked, when I was uh, president, and we had our first board meeting, we had already done the planning. And I just said, uh, here's how we're gonna do our board meetings. When you present your committee reports, you are not going to present a list of what the committee has done over the last month. I don't wanna see a bulleted list of things. What I wanna see is what has your committee done to help accomplish the goals in our plan? it changed how they reported out and it changed how we did our quarterly assemblies because that was to the whole membership. But no laundry list, didn't matter. What I wanted to see is we have goals, you each have assignments, we've already talked about committees getting involved. What I wanna see in your report is for the last month since we've met last, what have you all done that is lending itself to helping accomplish our goals and boy did it help. It really did. Um, so again, just 
take it for what it is. If anything, it keeps reinforcing to them that it's not about lists of things. It's not about just doing a bunch of things. It's we're trying to accomplish goals and have fun, right, Sonny? <laughs> In fact, you could have having fun be a goal if you are if you are so inclined. I wouldn't do that in my club, but I would. I know you would. <laughs> um, the other thing that's really important here is we talk about feedback loops, updates, communication. Communicate to the membership, like you talked about, Christine. What a great opportunity for quarterly assemblies. It could be maybe five minutes every meeting on an update on something. Keep the membership engaged. They all, whether they were part of the planning or not, they'll have a, a greater sense of ownership if there's that regular communication with them. Here's how it's going. Do you have any ideas? It looks like we're not getting our membership goal. We're kind of not on track. What ideas do you all have? And have that plan kind of be that you know adjustable so you're not locked in. I just, I just want to mention, Jeff, as an aside, that engagement and accomplishment are sources of fun. <laughs> to most people. Thank you, Sunshine. <laughs> um, yes. I, I, I delight in the fun of others. Tom, go ahead. I think what you're talking about also is sometimes someone working on projects has a tendency to isolate their self by having good feedback and, and uh, constant communication, either with the the president or the board or your members, uh, you're not isolated in your project. And, and that isolation can create uh, failures when you need help. So you need to be communicative. And since people uh, yeah. want people with accountabilities to succeed, they're more likely to pitch in if they can see where we are and where we're going. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, you, you gave some examples of strategies. Another strategy that clubs will often have is have uh, every member of the club be part of something, part of a committee, part of a project, something. That's another strategy. Maybe we don't have that right now. And that may be a difficult one, but we need to find good matches and so on. There's all sorts of strategies. And if you think about, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. We've got five minutes left. You all were great, uh, great examples. And again, I'm gonna send this to uh, Kathy and she'll send it out. If things aren't working, the candidate on what needs to be changed may not be the goal. It may be the strategy that you all came up with to accomplish the goal. I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to not change goals unless I have to. I'd rather look at the strategies first because I can come up with a different strategy or we can come up with a different strategy, but we put a lot of effort into thinking about what those goals should be, including maybe one of those big, hairy, audacious goals. It's easier to change the strategy and say, this strategy didn't work. That's fine. In fact, one thing that we talk about when we coach people on planning is there's a tendency to get down if we fail. We didn't accomplish a goal. And we're human beings, we have pride, uh, we are professionals, we tend to uh, get down on ourselves if we don't accomplish something. It really should be the reverse, it's learning from what didn't work to do it better going forward. Learn from things that don't work, figure it out, and that's where the analysis comes in. Why didn't this work? And let's figure out what changes we should make to the strategy that didn't work so we can come up with a strategy that does work for the same goal. I think that's where the elegance of this is. And all I can say, we're, we're running out of time. Again, I'm glad that RLI makes this double module. We could have spent another hour or two going through this. If you fail it, yeah. Fail, yeah. We need to get into the mindset that failure is not a negative. It's an opportunity. COVID provided opportunity to us. It was awful. It was a terrible period. It is a terrible period. We have shifted our mindset from the challenge of COVID to the opportunities that COVID is providing us that may benefit Rotary for the next 10, 20, 30 years. 
We don't want situations like COVID, but sometimes things happen that cause us to think differently. We wouldn't have thought about it before. And when we think differently, get into those new ideas, sometimes we hit those, those nuggets. It's like, wow, we can really grow and we can really prosper as a result of something that was just horrendous. Okay, we've got a couple minutes left. Um, I don't want to necessarily choose anyone. I am interested, Jessica, because you're with Rotaract. And Rotaract is like Rotary, but it's got a different dynamic and so on. Do you all have like a planning process and some kind of goals for the Rotaract Club? And, and is this what we talked about? Is it's kind of aligned with how you all think in Rotaract? Um, actually, yes. For Rotaract, uh, we have this uh, this planning about make um, every I was saying like a student they have different background. Like for example, uh, my major is computer information system, but I have um, teammates that they're in finance and accounting. So I think will be one of the plannings is make. Uh, these students leaders and they have the projects that really involve the students that are really interested in that. So I think what on the strike project um, for this year would be like give you uh, the students what I'm looking for. Like, and I was really interested about the committees because I think it's really helpful in like you're interested in one goal and you meet uh, people that have the same goal than you. And I think it would be like better for background, better ideas, and basically is the, uh, I would say the committee is really helpful. And for Rotaract is, is a form um, to meet up people that have the same ideas than you and improve them. That's great. And you know, um, so is one of the goals of your Rotaract club to ultimately take over the Camino Real club? I'm just kidding, sorry. <laughs> Forget I said that. Um, you know, it, with a lot of Rotaract clubs, they have high turnover. The college students, they move on. And committees are even more important when you've got a lot of turnover because you can have people come and go, but the committees still have a focus, still have a charge. They still have people that are participating. So when you've got turnover and people coming and going, the notion of having effective committees may be even more uh, important. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, anyone else? We've got a minute before we're going to take our break. Okay. Uh, Kathy, turn it back to you. All right. Excellent conversation. I, 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 again, I learned something. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thanks, Sunny. Um, learned something every time, every time. And so I know you guys are going to be much more effective in your uh, planning and organization and strategic planning specifically. So, hey, we've got time for a 20 minute break. And